for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. And welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. I'm Darren Gibson. I'm Jack Prince. And we have a plethora of topics today. I don't think I've used the word plethora on this show in quite a long time. Sounds um, good. It really does. Yeah. We're going to talk about the latest between Israel and Hamas. We also have a new house speaker. Don't be fooled by him. We'll give you the real skinny on this guy. And we will get to whatever topics we can get to within the hour. Before we get started today, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash Southpaws Radio Show. You can follow us on X, the former Twitter at Southpaws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at southpawsradioshow.tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube and Mastodon by doing a search for South Paws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Podvine, and Pandora by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, X, YouTube, Tumblr, and Mastodon accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, and KZGM in Kabul, Missouri. So be sure to listen to us on your local Pacifica affiliate. So let's go ahead and let's start out with the latest happenings in Gaza. We are recording this show just after 3 in the afternoon Eastern time on Wednesday, October 25th, 2023. So we may have updates to a couple of stories here during the show today. And if we do, we'll just add those in when we get those updates. Right. So this is uh, the latest on Israel and Hamas. This is the Associated Press uh, as of today. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees says its relief operations across the Gaza Strip will need to be sharply curtailed amid crippling Israeli airstrikes. Hospitals in Gaza are doing their best to provide treatment to the wounded with rapidly dwindling sources. The war in its 19th day is the deadliest of five Gaza wars for both sides. The Hamas-run health ministry said Wednesday that at least 6,546 Palestinians have been killed, 17,439 others have been wounded. In the occupied West Bank, more than 100 Palestinians have been killed, uh, 1,650 wounded in violence and Israeli raids since October 7th. The health ministry said airstrikes killed more than 750 people over the past 24 hours without saying how many were militants. The Associated Press could not independently verify the death toll cited by Hamas, which says it it tallies its figures from hospital directors. More than 1,400 people in Israel have been killed, according to Israeli officials, mostly civilians who died in the initial Hamas rampage. Israel's military on Wednesday raised the number of remaining hostages in Gaza to 222 people, including foreigners believed captured by Hamas during the incursion. Four hostages have been released. Two of them happen to be family members of former NBC News foreign correspondent Martin Fletcher. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you see Martin on uh, NBC News talking about it? No, I did not. Oh, okay. U.S. and other officials fear the fighting could spill over into a wider regional conflict. Here's what else is happening uh, in the latest uh, in the war. From the United Nations, Israel's U.N. ambassador says it's a disgrace that U.N. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez did not retract and apologize for his comments to Security Council and is again calling for the U.N. chief's resignation. Gilad Erdan was responding to the U.N. chief's comments earlier Wednesday, saying he was shocked that parts of his council statement were misrepresented. 
quote, as if I was justifying acts of terror by Hamas, end of quote. Gutierrez told reporters, quote, this is false, it was the opposite, end of quote. He reiterated his condemnation, quote, unequivocally of the horrifying and unprecedented 7 October acts of terror by Hamas in Israel, end of quote. Erdogan countered that the Secretary General, quote, once again distorts and twists reality, end of quote, pointing again to his statement Tuesday that the October 7th massacres, quote, did not happen in a vacuum. I want to stop right here and talk about this. Yeah, the vacuum. Yeah. So the U.N. Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, in a speech earlier Wednesday said that the war did not happen in a vacuum, basically. It's true. Or that the massacres didn't. What does he mean by that? Well, well, it's pretty obvious if you look at history what has happened. And, Jack, I'm sure you can speak on quite a bit of that. Right. I think that's a good way to term it, uh, in a vacuum. Because if you note, all of the conversation, all of the news pundits, all of the conversation, interviews with generals, interviews with political leaders, this whole episode starts unequivocally, every single time, with the invasion over the border by Hamas uh, the 7th of October. That's the beginning, that's the alpha point of the historical relationship between the Palestinians and the Israelis. That's as far back as they go. What is that now? Three, four weeks back. Mm -hmm. They won't go any farther. They won't talk about the consistent and insidious deposing of the people uh, from 1947 uh, to the present time and the atrocities that really were contained within that. So a, a vacuum means that something happens that is an invisible influence, a black hole in space. Why are these uh, planets acting like they are revolving around something when there's, when there's nothing there? So why did you have the uh, Hamas attack? As brutal and as terrible as it was, that you or I, neither one of us, would, would uh, in any way uh, support Yes. But why? What is the vacuum? What is the underlying? What is the invisible cause that nobody wants to look at, nobody wants to talk about? When I was teaching school, I brought in empirical uh, evidence and stories and testimony of how Israeli soldiers would lure Palestinian kids with, with candy and then kill them. This, yeah. this, was, this was, what, 10, 12 years ago? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it wasn't up for speculation. It wasn't, uh, now we, could, we can sit here and spend a whole hour talking about real incidents that lay in the middle of that vacuum. I just mentioned one, but suffice it to say, it is the most contemporary genocide in our world today, is what's happening in Israel. Forget the, yes. the overthrow of the American Indian, which we did, uh, the rightful uh, owners of this continent, uh, forget the uh, hundreds and hundreds of incursions into uh, sovereign countries by the, not the hundreds, but the dozens, by the British Empire. Today, the most current, the contemporary genocide is happening in what's called uh, Gaza. You can turn your, your screen on and see pictures of it. You can, you can see carpet bombing going on daily. If you have a seventh grader and you want to explain to them what genocide is, it's right in front of us. It's the it's the news of the day, and uh, I, I applaud the man for saying it. I applaud the students at Harvard that stood up and said they hold Israel to blame for the actions and the the terrible actions that resulted on the seventh of October. They they are intelligent enough to recognize what's really in that vacuum. It doesn't take an historical scholar to trace it. And I'd like to ask you, Darren. Uh, you, you've traced the overthrow of the American Indian and the uh, indigenous peoples of North America. We've talked about the atrocities of uh, the Catholic Church raping uh, kids in mass graves. We, we've yeah. talked uh, about that. We, we've talked about the abuse of power. And what did we always say was the colonel that caused that? And I don't mean a military colonel. I mean the nucleus. The, the center of those actions for that genocide in North America was was what? Was it greed? Was it uh, no? 
it was divine, was it not? Am I mistaken? It was it's religion, like Carlin yeah. said. Carlin said this as clear as day, and I should play his words. Hey, if you read history, you realize that God is one of the leading causes of death. <laughs> Has been for thousands of years. Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Christians, all taking turns killing each other because God told them it was a good idea. <laughs> the sword of God, the blood of the Lamb, vengeance is mine. Millions of dead motherfuckers. <laughs> Millions of dead motherfuckers, all because they gave the wrong answer to the God question. You believe in God? No. <laughs> dead. You believe in God? Yes. You believe in my God? No. Boom. <laughs> dead. My God has a bigger dick than your God. Thousands of years. Thousands of years. And all the best wars, too. The bloodiest, most brutal wars fought, all based on religious hatred. Right. God's the greatest cause of death. Yeah. Forget the moment. Forget, uh, what is the malaria? Forget that. Forget COVID. God is the leading cause of death. Yeah. And uh, for those who have never heard of the Manifest Destiny, it quoted it word for word that God had given to the white Caucasians the right, the responsibility to rule this continent from sea to sea. That was called the Manifest Destiny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th th let's just put it in a nutshell. The purest and the most severe forms of genocide historically have always derived from a godly privilege or a divine right or a divine mission which we, we now know as Americans, it happened in our own continent. But it's happening over there now. If you've never understood it, uh, you can see it in action. You can hear the cover-ups, but don't be deceived. It emanates from a nucleus of divine mission and rule and right. In an old book called the Old Testament that supposedly deeded that property by an invisible sky god <laughs> on a piece of paper <laughs> centuries uh, ago. And the, the conquest and the rule of Israel, in their mind, is divinely justified. How do you beat it? Well, I've seen the memes uh, floating across social media. I know you have uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's a map of Britain, and it says Rome over it. Why don't we give Britain back to Italy? Because the Roman Empire conquered Britain in 400-something A.D. No. Yeah. Give that land back to the Romans. You know, like I said on last week's show or a couple weeks ago, look what we did to the Native Americans, all the tribes here. Give that land yeah. back to them. Right. Oh, no, we but can't they, do any of that. Notice how the history of the American uh, uh, genocide uh, has some of the same elements as what the Israelis used, and that's promise, promise over and over again. Hey, we can work with you. Can work with us. We can absorb. We can have the uh, Native Americans uh, just come right in our society. Uh, you know, bottom line, uh, they're hanging on to the very existence, as we will see the Palestinians hanging on. You know, when you see these carpet bombings, where do you think if somehow all these people could be put in a container, safe and sound, off in the in the water someplace, and once the 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 revenge is the bloodlust is satisfied in the Israeli mouth. Where do all these people go to live? Where are these people going to live, the two and a half million people? They're losing their homes yeah. daily. They've, they've been losing their homes since 1947. Exactly. You know? The blood on the ground in Gaza is a direct result of obedience to an invisible God, an yeah. antiquated book called the Old Testament. That yeah. it's, it's no more complicated than that. Yes, indeed. And if you don't believe us, go back a couple of weeks ago. I went through the entire history of how modern-day Israel was created, starting with the summer of 1947, when Jewish immigrants were turned away from British-controlled Palestine and the outcry that came from that. You know, it really is that simple, folks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then they, they film uh, the, what I, what I want to call the violence, I guess, uh, the, the murder that took place in the kibbutz compounds, yeah. just feet from the, from the fence. Yes. Well, those kibbutz, the kibbutz has been the forward march, the forward point, the point of conquest, have been these little settlements called the kibbutzes. They're romantic. You know, let's go out. Let's all gather there in, in the chosen land and work hard and work with their hands on these little farms, these kibbutzes. 
Those are the forefront of the conquest. And people are aghast. Oh, my goodness, they broke into these kibbutz, these hardworking, uh, patriotic uh, Israel. Those are occupied regions that used to be lived in and by the Palestinian people. They, they get such a pass. I remember this song, uh, This Land is Mine. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. Excuse my singing. Mm-hmm. In the now famous historical movie called Exodus. Do you remember that by any chance? I in, do not. In the 60s, it, it was as propagandic as the uh, story that Mel Gibson made about Jesus. Oh, the Passion uh, of the Christ? The Passion of the Christ, which, uh, you know, rings everybody's heart, uh, seeing the, the brutal uh, crucifixion, and Mel pulled it off, right? Well, mm. the, the movie Exodus did the same thing. And that song, because I'm a little older, resonates in my mind because I was fed the BS at a young age. That, yeah. law, that land is, is a God's gift to Israeli people. God gave this land to me. You can Google it. Google, uh, Google the song. Yeah. That propaganda was pretty blatant then. It hasn't subsided. No. And the promise in the Bible to all these Western, I say Western religious people, Christians, is that if you pray for Israel, if you support Israel, God will bless you. It's there. We're being we're being controlled. We're being manipulated by a soggy old print and an unprovable God and an unprovable manuscript. And that has is still directing the actions of the United States. As I sit here and talk, they're talking about funding millions, billions of dollars in addition to the three billion dollars, three billion, I said, would be that we already give to to Israel. They, mm-hmm. they need more to fight who every time they say they're going to have a land incursion or a, a, a land invasion. I laugh. I, I, I laugh that you, you might as well have kids with a fort, a tree fort in the neighborhood and surround them with 100 tanks or 500 tanks and say you're going to have a, a land invasion. There's no army. There's no air force. There's no Navy there. If you think they're not going to kill thousands of innocent people by marching in there where they know damn well there's no Hamas, they're down in those tunnels. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. They, they don't care. That's part of their plan. I want to say this. I don't want to take much more time. There is a protest Saturday the 28th here in Grand Rapids at the Veterans Park, which if you're not familiar with Grand Rapids, it's kind of in the center of town, right downtown Veterans Park uh, at 2 o'clock. That's going to be supportive of ending the, the bombardment, a ceasefire. The, the very thing that Ms. Scolden, our Democratic representative here in town, said she was not for. She was not for a ceasefire. Uh, I don't even know if Biden is for but a ceasefire. You yeah. know you know who is, though? Bernard sure. Sanders. Bernie Sanders. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And Bernie Sanders is Jewish, folks. Yeah, and I'll he's... tell you who else is. There's a man named Noam Chomsky who's also Jewish. Yep. You know, I've been uplifted by a lot of voices on the left that have been very critical of what Israel has done. They, they've they also been equally critical with Hamas, and rightfully yeah. so. Understand. But the amount of voices on the left that have rightfully criticized the right, let me specify and stress, right-wing government of Israel. Netanyahu mm-hmm. is no better than Donald Trump. He no. is Israel's Donald Trump. That's right. That but I can right. tell you. But I can tell you who I've been disappointed in. Did you hear John Fetterman's criticism of Rashida Tlaib? I did not. Yeah, I believe uh, the senator, the junior senator from Pennsylvania, needs to uh, crack open a history book. Oh yeah, what you say? Uh, oh, he was critical. He he was absolutely yeah. critical of some comments that Rashida Tlaib made, and you know how how dare a sitting member of Congress criticize Israel? Blah blah blah. It, it, at least he didn't go as far as Marjorie Trader Green did. Made she made the comment that when when are the uh, suicide bombers coming to protest in Congress? Wow. Yeah, yeah, Marjorie Trader Green, who should rightfully be prosecuted for her role in the January 6th traitorous riot. Huh. She's got a lot of nerve to speak, doesn't she? Yeah, you know, 
if there is one bit of bipartisan activity or sentiment, the only one I can think of recently is the shared support from the right and the left, unequivocally, unabashedly, without question, to Israel. Yep. Right and left. There, there are some, and you mentioned, of course, Bernie, no surprise, but it really takes an enlightened person who's historically honest to realize where this came from, how it will never be settled, and until how you somehow have the, the Old Testament eradicated and nullified, uh, and, and, and the religious beliefs on both sides of the fence, Darren, I'll be fair here, both sides of the, uh, of the border, mm-hmm. of, the, of this whole um, fiasco, somehow dissolve. And you know that's not going to happen. That yeah. will not happen. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, I want to get to a couple of other stories involving uh, the Israel-Hamas conflict. French President Emmanuel Macron said that France is going to send a Navy ship to bring aid to hospitals in the Gaza Strip. Uh, The ship will leave the French military port of Toulon in the Mediterranean Sea within 48 hours. He did not provide further details. Yeah, the hospitals in Gaza are running out of fuel to power the generators. Yeah, thousands of kids, incubators, shutting off. Yeah. You can't, like I said, this is the dictionary's picture of uh, genocide right now. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sickened. I, I had to turn away from the screen I when know. I see uh, pictures of, of cars, not ambulances, just cars packed with people holding infants. Infants. The doors open, they all burst out, running, screaming, pu- pulling t- uh, girls out, dead babies out of rubble. Yeah, we've been seeing that nightly on the news. Yeah, two days ago, I think they killed, what, 400? Two, half of them were kids in one night's bombing. I just worry about if these images kept keep getting shown over and over again, how numb society is going to be to that. Well, I'll tell you who's not numbing. It might, the American public might be. Yeah. But the surrounding Arabic nations, <laughs> I, I've no. seen pictures of protests that cover the face of the earth. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and oh, at some know. point, that's going to boil over. If I'm not mistaken, Israel's launching missiles in a lot of directions. And, and uh, there have been protests in large cities like New York and yeah, so other cities. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking well, of protests, one area where there should be protests, and rightfully so every day, Ottawa County, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Let's get into the latest involving Ottawa Impact and Ottawa County's Board of Commissioners. We mentioned to you last week that they were going to hold the termination hearing for Health Officer Adeline Hambly. That started on Tuesday, and it's continuing right now as we're recording. Uh, So let me get to this story. This is Mitchell Boltman and Sarah Leach writing for the Holland Sentinel, dated October 25th. And and by the way, Sarah Leach, I think I mentioned it on an earlier episode, is being nominated for a Pulitzer for her coverage of Ottawa County. Right. That's great. The the list of witnesses in a termination hearing for Ottawa County Administrative Health Officer Adeline Hambly brought in a pair of former county employees Tuesday afternoon before shifting to Administrator John Whalefeces Gibbs and Hambly herself Wednesday morning. The hearing was allowed to move forward Tuesday, October 24th, by Muskegon County 14th Circuit Court Judge Jenny L. McNeil, who said Monday she didn't have standing to intervene prior to the termination hearing taking place, but added that Hambly has the right to seek relief in the courts after the board presumably removes her. It began with testimony from a handful of Ottawa County officials, including County Clerk Justin Roebuck, Human Resources Director Marcy Verbeek, and Fiscal Services Director Karen Karasinski. Board Chair and Ottawa Impact founder Joe Moss filed notice September 27th that a removal hearing was planned for Hambly over allegations of incompetence, misconduct, and neglect of duty. Moss's allegations revolve largely around health department budget negotiations, which culminated in $4 million in board-orchestrated cuts and half a dozen layoffs for the fiscal year that began October 1st. Now, here's what they're saying is misconduct. The charges against her are that Hambly demonstrated incompetence, misconduct, and neglect of duty by making false public representations about budgetary scenarios, 
that Hambly demonstrated incompetence, misconduct, and neglect of duty by falsely claiming that she was not included in the budget process, that Hambly demonstrated incompetence, misconduct, and neglect of duty by failing to cooperate in the budget process, and that Hambly demonstrated incompetence, misconduct, and neglect of duty by making false claims that encouraged and caused confusion, anxiety, fear, and panic in the community. Those all sound like things that the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners are guilty of, don't you think? Uh, yes, indeed. You forgot one charge. Didn't she scout illegally for the University of Michigan Wolverines, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I didn't see her in the stands uh, stealing signs, but who hey, knows? Listen, this whole supposed firing, is a, it's a scam. It truly is. It has nothing to do with her confidence. Absolutely not. It's a, a continued eradication of public offices and the institutions that are public, which you and I both know is a penchant for uh, repugs. It, it's part, it's their DNA. Uh, we watch these radical magas try and tear down everything, not not just uh, health uh, directors, but uh, they want to destroy the Department of Ed. If, if elected, put into office, they want to destroy the Department of Ed. Any yeah. any public any public institution, public service. They are against it. They, they want to burn it all. They, they don't want to work with it. They want to burn it all. They don't like public servants. This no. one's a public servant. Yeah. The removal hearing is required by state law before the board can officially terminate Hambly from her position. Attorney Sarah Riley Howard represented Hambly. David Coleman of Coleman Legal Group represented the Ottawa County Board. Retired Judge Thomas Brennan presided over the hearing, adding he was there to provide order not to issue any rulings. Brennan said he wouldn't rule on any objections, but the parties were free to make objections for any future purpose where it may be relevant, probably in court. The final trio of witnesses during Tuesday's session included a pair of former county employees, John Shea and Patrick Waterman. Shea was the county administrator from August 2021 until January 3, 2023, when he was fired by the board and replaced with whale feces. Shea is now Wyoming's city manager. Waterman was deputy county administrator for eight months until he resigned in July, citing an inability to establish a working relationship with whale feces. He is now the assistant city manager in Wyoming. Can you tell that I hate John Gibbs? Did, did you did you see the photo of him today? He looked like he had a couple of growths on the back of his neck. Oh, excuse me, that was his head. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, still going to whale feces. Yeah. Howard asked Shea several questions about an exchange between himself and Commissioner Gretchen Cosby, a commissioner elect at the time in December. Cosby has referenced the exchange in previous meetings, saying attempts to meet with Hambly and former health officer Lisa Stefanovsky went unanswered. Howard showed an email sent December 16, 2022 from Cosby to Shea asking to meet Hambly, Stefanovsky, and Lynn Doyle. Shea responded saying it was, quote, a great idea, end of quote, and provided email and direct phone numbers for each person. Howard asked Shea if he met with Moss and Sylvia Rodea on December 13, 2022, the day Hambly was hired, and if the topic of Hambly's hiring came up during that meeting. Shea said, yes, they were upset with that. They felt the incoming board should make that decision and not the outgoing board, end of quote. Questioning of Waterman started by detailing his relationship with whale feces. Waterman said he had difficulties with items like day-to-day -day communications and scheduling. Waterman also indicated that Whale Feces was unhappy with representation from the Kalman Legal Group. Uh-oh. Uh. <laughs> There's dissension within the ranks. <laughs> Waterman said whale feces expressed frustration on multiple occasions that corporate counsel was causing delays in contracts and grants. Whale feces later said he hadn't complained about attorney Jack Jordan, but had spoken to Moss and Rodea about communication issues. Waterman said whale feces expressed concern his job could be in danger if he went against Moss and Rodea. Well, let's see. They fired the board administrator before Gibbs. 
yep. Mr. Whale feces. You you think he'd be right to be concerned about his job if he went against those two? Let me think. <laughs> Uh, Waterman said, quote, in many conversations he and I had one-on-one, -on -one, he was more candid about his concerns for standing up to the board on issues, end of quote. He added that whale feces used the phrase, quote, end up at the bottom of a river, end of quote, meaning he felt his job was in jeopardy if he didn't, quote, follow directives to a T, end of quote. Well, it is whale feces. It'll end up at the bottom of the ocean. So there you go. In his testimony Wednesday, whale feces said he doesn't recall using that phrase. You know what I say to that, right? Yeah. Bull feces. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you just have to laugh. You know, like I yeah. said, you want pure genocide, turn on MSNBC and watch it every night. You want to see the fruit, the absolute end of the fruit of Republican conservative leadership and thinking, peak at Ottawa County. It yeah. is their mecca. It, it is their sample of what they'd like to do nationally. It's terrifying. Yes, it is. Howard also asked Waterman about the hiring of Jordan Epperson. Waterman said he had concerns similar to those shared by Marcy Van Beek earlier Tuesday. He said Epperson believed ethics, quote, depend on who you're working for, end of quote, and that government positions like the role he was interviewing for are absolutely political. Mm -hmm. Waterman said Ryan Kimball, who filed an age discrimination lawsuit against Ottawa County on Tuesday, which we will get to that story in just a little bit, was the preferred candidate of the hiring committee, but whale feces directed Verbeek to hire Epperson anyway. Waterman also spoke about early budget discussions, saying he was involved at the beginning of meetings before whale feces stopped inviting him. He said that Hambly was courteous and professional during meetings with whale feces in his experience. So I wonder if they cut him out of the meetings so that they could trump up these charges against Hambly. I would think so. Yeah. Trump up, there's a verb for you. Yeah, no kidding. During his cross-examination, Coleman focused on the fact that Waterman was no longer employed at the county in August and September when the bulk of budget discussions took place. Although only seven witnesses were scheduled for Tuesday, Howard called an eighth witness at the end of the session, Ottawa County IT Director Paul Clemus. Howard asked Clemus about litigation holds, a notification from a legal department to employees to not delete any electronic or physical records that may pertain to current or imminent litigation. Clemus said he's never had a litigation hold request in his four years with the county. He said any such request would come to his department for implementation. So there you go. They might be deleting evidence and destroying evidence. Never heard of that before. Yeah, oh, that, that's like Trump uh, flushing documents down the toilet of the White House. Remember that? It certainly is. Yep. Yeah. They read his book. Yep. Howard, referencing Hambly's ongoing lawsuit against the Board of Commissioners, asked if a litigation hold was requested by corporate counsel. Clemus said it was not. Coleman had no questions during cross-examination. Throughout her questioning Tuesday, Howard frequently asked those testifying if they've witnessed Hambly demonstrating incompetence or misconduct in her role. Each said, in their experience working with Hambly, they have not. The first witness called Wednesday was whale feces. He declined to answer Howard's first question about when he was offered the job, saying it was irrelevant to the hearing. No, it is relevant to the hearing. Sorry, I the public needs to know. Yeah, absolutely. Howard disagreed and asked either Moss or Brennan to compel whale feces to answer. Brennan said neither he nor Moss had any authority to compel. Coleman conferred with whale feces to advise him, after which whale feces did answer the question. Gibbs said he was given the job January 3rd and was at the meeting because he knew, quote, there was a possibility, end of quote, he would be hired. Howard asked Whale Feces for his perspective on several items discussed by witnesses on Tuesday. 
His most frequent response, quote, I don't remember, end of quote. Well, if he's got that bad of a memory, why is he running the county? That's one of the more observable faults. A bad memory, I have more. Yeah. About 35 minutes into Gibbs' testimony, Howard asked him about the process of hiring Epperson. Gibbs said he couldn't answer due to ongoing litigation. Howard again asked Moss to compel Gibbs to answer the question. Uh, Brennan Moss and Stephen Coleman again said there was no authority to compel an answer. Brennan told Howard she could either file an objection on the record and continue her questioning or call for a recess until she could get a ruling on the statute from a trial court judge. After consulting with Hambly, Howard decided not to pursue the line of questioning on Epperson and continued with Wednesday's hearing. She did, however, record an objection saying they weren't being given a full and fair opportunity to question whale feces, Mr. Gibbs. Howard then shifted her focus to the county's budget process and communications between Gibbs and Hambly. Those questions went on for more than an hour. After Gibbs said it was inappropriate for Hambly to share budget information with the public when numbers weren't finalized, Howard showed an August 22nd press release from Moss on his campaign website about the proposal to return the health department budget to pre-COVID levels. Gibbs stood by his opinion. So it's okay for him to throw numbers out, even if they're not finalized, but it's not okay for her. You know, it just amazes me that this POS named Gibbs actually garnished, what, a few million votes here in the state of Michigan for governorship. No, he was running for Congress, Hillary Scolton. Congress, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Congress. yeah. Yeah. Incredible, he, isn't it? yeah, yeah, misogynistic, women shouldn't be in power, women should be in the kitchen barefoot and praying them whatever. And yeah, that's not hyperbole. Like no, Darren's there's saying. proof of it. Yeah. Later, Gibbs said an August 30th release from Hambly saying she didn't have the latest budget and wasn't being included demonstrated the charge of incompetence because she would have had the budget in the coming days. When asked why Moss and Gibbs could issue press releases but not Hambly, Gibbs said he couldn't speak for Moss and that his release was only in response. Yeah, and by the way, that was about the time that they took away the health department's right to issue press releases. Those now came right out of the county board. <sighs> yeah, this is just really bizarre stuff here that we're seeing. Has oh. government? Have you ever seen a government run like this? Oh, no. Again, it's a dictatorship 101. Yeah. Howard and Gibbs discussed requests by Gibbs and Cosby to Hambly for minimum service levels required by the state. Hambly responded to those requests, but Gibbs said she didn't provide exact staff numbers or funding amounts needed to meet those minimums. He said that Hambly claiming proposed budget drafts wouldn't meet minimum service levels while not providing exact numbers were, quote, outlandish claims that were tr untruthful and fear-mongering, end of quote. It bullshit there they're hungry wow yeah yeah you know and i think people have just written off ottawa they're not thinking that much about it when this is a case study they, they should study their techniques and tactics yeah it's ridiculous yeah. it really is. uh the hearing was con expected to conclude after press time wednesday so i have a feeling we'll have a uh some sort of a decision on thursday if we do we will add it into the show yeah, rightfully so. It, it is so scary. 20 miles west of here. Yeah. With this kind of uh, corrupt, anti-democratic clown show is unfolding. They are. Uh, they're, they're absolutely corrupt. Oh, hell yes. I want to real quickly touch on a couple of other stories involving Ottawa County. The first one uh, we had mentioned during the story involving the firing hearing about Hambly that the county was being sued. Well, we have this story here from Sarah Leach at the Holland Sentinel. During questioning of key witnesses in a legislative hearing that could see the termination of Ottawa County Health Officer Adeline Hambly, a separate hiring decision was discussed. It was the hiring of 23-year-old Jordan Epperson, now the executive aide to the county administrator. A question was whether Epperson was the best candidate for the job. And as it was discussed, one of the other candidates, Ryan Kimball, filed a lawsuit. 
The 49-year-old Kimball was a finalist for the aid position this summer. He filed a lawsuit in Ottawa County's 20th Circuit Court on Tuesday alleging age discrimination after County Administrator John Gibbs hired Epperson over him despite Kimball being more qualified. Man, they keep throwing good money after bad, don't they? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm still hooked on the the invoking of God and the, uh, the people's house, okay, <laughs> to show you just how this cancer can spread, right? Yeah. And, and, and to, and he went on, I thought maybe, maybe I, I missed it. I, I thought that this was a secular government. I mean, I, I could see in Jerusalem talking about God ordaining the meeting that took place today where they voted unanimously or 220 votes for this guy. Yeah. But, but here we're, we're not supposed to say things are happening by God, for God, with God. They put the coin uh, logo in 1956. That is not indicative of our form of government. No, it we isn't. Do not invoke God. Watch it, and and not a single person will will squawk or say a, a peep uh, about it. And yeah. and these things are latent in our government. The one in Ottawa County should be textbook study. How they work, what they'll do if they're put into power, every move they make. Is indicative and, and, and is helpful, and we got this bozo in Washington walking hand in hand with God. Well, we're talking about a world with a flame, <laughs> with God's flames, right? With yeah. God in both. Really? Oh, I gotta sit back down. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll talk about the uh, election of Mike Johnson here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, let me get back to Ottawa County. In the lawsuit, Kimball's attorneys Robert Howard and Bradley Glazier of the Grand Rapids-based Boston Glazier argue that Gibbs and therefore the county violated Michigan's Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act. Oh, they're going to be screwed on that one. They're going to get screwed big time, the county is. Yeah. According to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, age discrimination is treating an applicant or employee less favorably because of his or her age. There are specific legal protections afforded to individuals over the age of 40. The law prohibits discrimination in any aspect of employment, including hiring and firing. Howard and Glazier said Gibbs violated the Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act by saying he wanted Upperson for the job because he was young and could be bossed around. So Gibbs is learning real fast from Moss and Sylvia Rodea, isn't he? Yeah. They hired him because he could be bossed around, and now he's hiring somebody else, so he's got somebody to boss around. <laughs> you know, I, I, do you notice a similarity between Clarence Thomas and Gibbs? Just a visual, I don't know, You kind of like they're sitting on mom's lap or something. <laughs> uh, no. and, and these Toms are so destructive yeah. because they, they discovered that, hey, if you have black skin— and believe me, I'm not, I'm not a racist person. If you have black skin and you support the conservative, particularly the MAGA madness, your ticket's written, man. Your ticket's punched. Power, wealth, influence, trips, education, trips around the world, what oh, yeah. throws on your, on your wife. What, what, hey, the sky's the limit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is Gibbs even married? I don't think he, I don't think any woman would want him, truthfully. Uh, Mom is probably not for that yet. They got a real tight relationship, Mom. And Gibby. yeah, yeah, he's probably trying to find somebody just like Mom. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like Clarence Thomas's wife. That'd yeah. be a catch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need a hook and some bait. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, um, the preferred candidate for this position, which, by the way. Cost an extra thirty-seven thousand plus dollars to upgrade the position. Here's what the preferred candidate would have looked like: they would have had a master in business administration from an accredited institution with specific experience in strategic management, innovation, and marketing or branding, a slot on the dean's list or honor roll, an undergraduate major or minor from an accredited institution in an analytical or engineering discipline, strongly preferred, experience working internationally at the nonprofit level, strongly preferred, 
and at least two years of experience serving on a major board. Of the five mandatory criteria, the county sought Epperson had one, a bachelor's degree. Meanwhile, Kimball holds... In what, I wonder? Um, if I remember, it has something to do with waste management. I forgot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Kimball holds a master's degree, has experience in strategic management, made the dean's list for both his bachelor's and master's programs, has experience working at the international nonprofit level, has served at least two years on a major board, and has experience in management and finance. The uh, Holland Sentinel reported in early September that heavily redacted emails indicated differences of opinion as to who should have been offered the job. Uh, by the way, they have tried to get the unredacted emails and that has been denied. They have uh, responded by appealing the denial of that FOIA request. So more cover-up from Ottawa County, right? Yep. Yep. Same old. Yep. So let, let's get back. You're, you're mentioning the parallel between Ottawa County and Washington, D.C. So let's get to this. We finally have a House speaker. Finally. Yeah. We've, they've, got, they've yeah. gone through Jim Jordan. They went through Steve Scalise. They went through some other guy, and he wasn't around long enough for me to remember his name. Now they go to Mike Johnson out of Louisiana. So what do you know about this clown? Well, he's supposedly kind of a jovial, uh, affable guy that gets along with, with Democrats. Of course, when you say get along, anything you know short of... Uh, Attack, physical attack uh, on the steps of the White House is getting along nowadays. Yeah, but uh, how how funny he is, and how uh, jovial he is, is really inconsequential. It's what he has stood for, voted for, uh, and I would remind people that list includes he's an election denier. Okay, he uh, voted against uh, the marijuana uh, bill. He, he's voted against uh, and with every hard right wing MAGA person sitting over in the corner, all six of them or seven of them. Uh, so he's he's a wolf in wolf clothing. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that the accomplishment to the Republicans, if there's such thing as a moderate Republican, that's debatable, is that the, the firestorm of incompetency now has been quelled. There's no way they can point to the House in an uproar where the world is aflame by trying to find somebody <laughs> I'll agree with. So that, that's been extinguished. But when the smoke clears, you're going to have a mega guy that looks uh, like Peabody, we talked about that off. <laughs> Peabody uh, and Sherman. Yeah, you know, he's, he's not a flamethrower, not a bomb thrower like what's a James, uh, the abusive wrestling coach. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jack, uh, hey, Jack, real quick, are you outdoors? I, I, Chico is uh, pulling me, he's got to go to the bathroom. Um, maybe I should let you take it from here because uh, there's cars going by all of a sudden. Okay, yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm picking up the uh, interference big time here. Yeah, let me let me just really quickly add this whole uh, fiasco at Michigan about the scouting is, is a joke. Yeah, uh, that's ubiquitous. They do it all over the place. I know it's uh, you know it's another stab at hardball, but uh, I just want to let the viewers know that I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, and uh, Darren, we'll talk later, buddy. I'm gonna Chico's got to <laughs> Chico's got to Chico's got to drop a Donald Trump, doesn't he? Yeah, well, he heard all the talk about the uh, Speaker of the House and so forth. Suddenly, he got sick to his stomach. had to bring him out. Oh, poor guy. Give, yeah. give, him, give him a pet on the head for me. <laughs> all right, Dan. All right. Hey, we'll talk, talk later, buddy. All right. Thanks, Jack. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. All right. And that, that is Jack Prince uh, leaving us. Uh, unfortunately, our executive producer uh, needed to take a Donald Trump on the lawn. So there we go. So this uh, story about Mike Johnson comes from NBC News. This is Sohil Kapoor and Ali Vitali and Rebecca Kaploff. So here are some five things to know about Johnson. Johnson is a constitutional lawyer who has used his talents to craft some creative and controversial theories. The most notable is his role in devising an argument aimed at keeping Donald Trump in power even though he lost the 2020 election. A New York Times article last year called Johnson, quote, the most important architect of the Electoral College objections on January 6, 2021. 
His argument to colleagues was that certain states' changes to their voting procedures during the COVID-19 pandemic were unconstitutional, an argument that became more palatable to lawmakers than the fabricated claims of mass fraud. In all, 147 Republicans voted to block the certification of Joe Biden's electors. In mid-November 2020, Johnson gave a radio interview and echoed a discredited conspiracy theory involving Hugo Chavez and Dominion voting systems. So Hugo Chavez has been dead for a number of years, the, the, the former leader of Venezuela. So they're invoking his name and Dominion voting systems. Listen to this. Johnson said, quote, In every election in American history, there's some small element of fraud irregularity. But when you have it on a broad scale, when you have a software system that is used all around the country that is suspect because it came from Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, when you have testimonials of people that like this but in large numbers, it begs to be litigated and investigated. End of quote. On Tuesday night after he was nominated, Johnson declined to respond to a request to a question about his role in the election objections. During Trump's presidency, ugh, ugh, I, those two words should never go together ever again. Johnson argued that then Speaker Nancy Pelosi's move to rip up a copy of his State of the Union speech was a crime. He told Fox Propaganda Channel at the time, quote, a lot of people have been talking about this the last 48 hours, and I did a little legal memo to point out to my colleagues that she actually committed a felony. End of quote. <laughs> Another thing to know about him is that he has a lifetime rating of 92% from the American Conservative Union and 90% from Heritage Action. Johnson voted against a slew of bipartisan bills in Biden's first two years in office, including to establish the January 6th Independent Commission, the Infrastructure Law, the Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, a modest new gun law, and the Chips and Science Act. So he's anti-woman, just like all Republicans are, anti-woman. They don't believe in abortion. They don't believe that women should be treated as human beings. Oh, no, women should be beaten and forcibly impregnated. That's what they think, folks. They really do. Uh, earlier in the year, he voted in favor of the debt limit law negotiated by Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden, but he voted against the stopgap bill to avert a government shutdown on October 1st. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, by the way, he uh, the next thing to know, he has an A-plus rating from the Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America group. So he is hardcore anti-abortion he is hardcore anti-lgbtq he has trump's stamp of approval sort of wednesday morning hours before the expected vote donald trump said he wasn't technically endorsing johnson but suggested that the house elect him during an appearance uh, earlier today on uh, right-wing host steve bannon's podcast Representative Matt Gates, Republican of Florida, called him, quote, MAGA Mike Johnson, end of quote. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Gates is too busy being on Steve Bannon's podcast. Uh, at least at least it's keeping him busy from trolling the high school grounds looking for a date. Uh, <laughs> yes, Matt Gates is a pedophile. I said it. Allegedly. And the last thing you know, he is relatively inexperienced. He is only seven years under his belt as a congressman. So there you go, folks. This guy is scary as hell. You should avoid him at all costs. Unbelievable. And I tell you what, let's get to our final story here. Let's go back to Ottawa County. This is Sarah Leach writing for the Holland Sentinel. This article is dated October 20th. This is an update to the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power. Listen to this. This is amazing stuff here. The manager for Grand Haven Board of Light and Power submitted his resignation amidst an ongoing independent investigation brought forward by a whistleblower into the conduct of the utility. GHBLP manager Dave Walters issued a statement at the utility's monthly meeting Thursday, October 19th, 
saying that he was giving a 90-day notice of his retirement, which will be effective January 18th. Earlier this week, the Grand Haven City Council voted to approve the hiring of attorney Michael Homier of Grand Rapids-based Foster Swift to lead an independent review of the whistleblower allegations, which includes claims that the utility conducted a coordinated attempt to destroy documents to circumvent a Freedom of Information Act request, repeated false and misleading statements to employees regarding a proposed charter amendment to dissolve the BLP, attempted to avoid compliance with the requirements of the Open Meetings Act, and pressure employees to sign a letter to contribute funds and distribute door signs, all opposed to the Charter Amendment, potentially in violation of state law. There have also been allegations against Walters, including violation of state campaign finance rules that don't permit public entities and employees to advocate for the outcome of a political campaign. A grassroots organization, the Board of Light and Power Charter Change Coalition, announced in April its intention to have a charter amendment placed on the upcoming November ballot for city voters to approve or reject. If passed, the amendment would dissolve the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power and transition the utility into a city department. There have been at least two complaints filed with the Michigan Secretary of State Office against the GHBLP. One alleges the board, quote, used public funds or resources for campaign purposes, end of quote, and, quote, misused public funds to distribute misinformation, end of quote, via mailers and advertisements that contain, quote, non-factual information, end of quote. That is according to a copy of the complaint obtained by the Holland Sentinel. The other complaint alleges that Walters overstepped his informative role during a board meeting September 28th by, quote, using a public office space, funds, and property for campaign purposes, end of quote. Walter spoke during public comment arguing his own whistleblower complaint against GHBLP board member Andrea Hendrick earlier this year was never properly investigated. When asked for documentation of Walter's complaint, GHBLP board chair Michael Westbrook told the Holland Sentinel in a September 30th email, quote, the general manager's long-standing whistleblower complaint was filed appropriately and was in the process of being investigated confidentially as appropriate, end of quote. During a meeting of the Grand Haven City Council on September 18th, where it first authorized the city manager to seek an attorney to investigate the whistleblower claims, he did not provide documentation on specific allegations from Walters about wrongdoing by Hendrick. Hendrick, who is running currently for mayor, did not respond to an October 20th request for comment. Walters went on to say in his resignation letter that he will, quote, work amicably with the board to reach a fair and equitable settlement, end of quote. Westbrook sent a statement Friday praising Walters' time with the utility. He wrote to the Holland Sentinel, quote, I want to thank Dave Walters for his excellent service to the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power and the entire region as a whole. The outpouring of support he received from the public at our board meeting immediately after his announcement is testament to his legacy of exemplary service, end of quote. Westbrook said Walter's decision was in part affected by charged political discourse over the past several months. So there's the latest update on the Grand Haven Board of Light and Power. You know, George Carlin said the problem is not government, it's who we elect to serve as government leaders. Garbage in, garbage out. When you're a selfish society, you elect selfish leaders. It's the truth, folks. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson. On behalf of Jack Prince, please support independent media, the First Amendment, and a woman's right to choose. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.